one of the challenges with data is that it's, it can be patchy. Um, either you've got a short history or you don't have regional coverage in a certain area. So if the data is patchy, there's always risks associated with that. So could you un unpack that a little bit from a research point of view? Yeah, so actually this is one a huge challenge, especially if you come from a more um, traditional asset pricing perspective, right, the Pharma French School. So, you know, if you want to look at value, quality, momentum, you can literally go back 100 years, right, or more, actually. I think uh, one of my colleagues recently looked at value investing from the 1860s. And guess what? Over the last 150 years, it's actually generally worked, right? Well, you know, with alternative data, it's just not possible to go back 160 years. It's barely even possible to go back 10 or 15 years, really, right? So what do you have to do? Well, I think, you know, I, I think one, one way to get around this problem, you know, as a quant is that you have, you know, you have to have a, a solid economic rationale first, right? You have to understand, you know, like not fancy, you know, um, it just works out that way or high correlation, but why is it intuitively this thing should work? So I use the credit card as an example. So if you have a data set that tell you, you know, company A has high credit card sales, um, the, you, you know, then you say, okay, well, if high credit card sell all else equal, you know, probably e equal to, you know, high overall sales, which leads to high revenue, which leads to high, you know, stock price or, you know, asset price, right, which is very basic. But this is an economic hypothesis you made, right? So now and then with all the tools that you have, you have to be able to basically test each step of this economic channel. Um, in, you know, in quant parlance, this is what's called ancillary testing. You're looking for ancillary evidence instead of direct evidence of stock, you know, going back, going higher or lower in the back test, right? So, you, you know, price correlation or price prediction in, in the back test is not enough because you never see the back back test. You have to check all the other, you know, things around this. Say, if this is true, what else must be true? And if it isn't true, you have to ask yourself very honestly why it isn't true. And, um, and you know, I mentioned the word honest, right? Being honest is super important. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you can fool yourself all you want. You can't fool the market. So I think, you know, having incentive, keeping people honest is very, very important. And how do you keep people honest? Well, people respond to incentives, right? I mean, I mean that's just the way it, it, it works. So, you know, one of the way to keep people honest is actually have people's pay tied to the signal they research, what they develop, right? You know, over, over a period of time. Um, you know, if the stuff that you, you develop, you say it'll work, it actually works, then you get paid, right? Or, you know, you get paid more. Um, you know, I think this is a very powerful mechanism to keep people honest. Hmm. It's interesting. It, you know, the example of alternative data that always trips off the tongue is credit card data. Um, and actually, in one of the sessions this morning, somebody mentioned the fact that um, eventually the alpha potential in a signal will decay. And I think credit card data is... There's, there, I mean, in general, I mean, if you use credit card data in a straightforward manner, there's no alpha already. I no, because... There hasn't uh, been alpha for years. Yeah, and credit card data is, is essentially the new consensus. Um, you know, there may be variations in where you get it from, but the alpha has decayed. It's, it's like it has a shelf life of a data set. So, Dan... For, for from a, the supply, the, the point of view of somebody who supplies data, how do you reconcile that with your customers? The Listen, 100% there is a shelf life. There's a shelf life um, for all these products. I'd say when we think about a particular, uh, a particular data product, uh, one that is adding an edge only in its timeliness of reporting information it's probably going to have a shorter shelf life because it'll be broadly adopted and then everybody's getting the, the information that quickly. What uh, tends to have a longer shelf life is content that informs on uh, movement and logistics, the, the, the movement of, of people, money, and things. Uh, likewise, if the content is used standalone, then it's going to have a shorter shelf life than if it uh, marries well with other content and finds synergy. Uh, if a data set is plug and play, shorter shelf life. If it's got, uh, if there's a capability, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, needed to extract the information, then the shelf life's longer and, and tied to the development of that capability as well. So, um, Mike, back to you. Um, give, given that context, that uh, well, two things actually. Um, I'm sorry to spring this on you, but. Is, do you think it's important to use multiple signals from different data sets in combination? And do you think you can build a strategy that's comprised 
it just exclusively all of alternative data, or do you roll fundamental data into that as well? Yeah, I definitely think it's you know um, useful to use multiple combina combination of multiple signals, not just combination of multiple signal, but multiple data sets in a signal, actually, right? Um, you know, again, use the credit card example. Credit card in a very straightforward application has no alpha for several years now, but if you combine it with something else, which I won't mention, you know what, guess what? We, we actually have been able to extract alpha from it, right? So, so, that, um, so definitely multiple signals is good, right? And um, what's the second question? Sorry. <laughs> um, the second question is, do you think you can build a strategy just yeah, using alternative yeah, data? Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, so in, in general, I, I, I think it's difficult, actually. So, you know, we, we, we it, it, listen, I mean, you know, I, I'm the head of alternative alpha research, so obviously I, I think alternative alpha, alternative data is, the, is you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I, you know, bash pharma French whenever I can. But you know what? Pharma French factors still explain about roughly two-thirds of the market cross-sectional variation, right? So if you're only using alternative data, you're basically missing a huge part of market drivers. Um, so, so, you know, I, and, and for most of the quant strategy, unless you run, you know, relatively short horizon, say anything between three, three months or longer, you really need to have distilled more fundamental data in there. I mean, rule of thumb, not always, but rule of thumb is alternative data tends to decay faster, tends to have faster horizon, right? So they tend to not work as well over a longer horizon. So for anything three months or longer holding period, you typically want to have you know, a combination of traditional and alternative data, just from personal experience. Um, obviously, you can build shorter horizon signals, right? And we have, and then, you know, stuff that also include using, you know, a lot of machine learning or, you know, stat arb type of stuff, right? And those kind of strategies, um, in some cases, you may be able to just mostly or purely rely on alternative data. Okay. Um, do you have a perspective I, I just on that? You know, and I agree with you know, nearly everything you said, but I, I do think that you know when we say that the, the credit card data you know, has no more alpha. You're talking about like the most naive way of exactly. using the credit no, card data. Most straightforward. If you ask the right questions, I still think it's one of the most rich and fruitful data sets out there. And particularly if you apply different types of you know, machine learning and you know cohort analysis, like you know, there's. We still don't have to tell people that. Let them keep thinking there's no alpha left. <laughs> no, I agree with you. What I meant is basically just super naive. You know, brain dead. Just okay. Yeah. Get in, use it. Type. <laughs> um, uh, Dan, back to you. I, I, I've heard people often say, well, if your data is so good, why don't you just trade it yourself? Why do you sell it to other people? How do you, how do you cope with that? Yeah, I mean, so I'd say that uh, good data and analytics are a necessary but not a sufficient condition for a successful asset management shop. There are uh, quite a number of uh, other, other things that go into it, right? Um, and I don't think I have to tell the audience here. Uh, about that, uh, I would say you know S and P Global and and myself personally, I think um, add value to the process by sourcing uh, and vetting differentiated data, and uh, by standardizing the presentation and the delivery of the content, and uh, developing those capabilities for the feature extraction, and we're doing that at scale. Uh, so you know trading assets, I don't think helps add to our personal alpha. <laughs> 